Chapter 2. Tuon makes a proposition. I wish that his hands had been placed upon my head, that his arm had been thrown around me, and that I might have seen his kind look when he said, Let the little ones come unto me. Child, where are you? Mother looked about in the gathering darkness. Come, we are all going to the teacher's house to see the Tuon. Mother, I, I don't want to go, wailed the poor little girl. Hush, of course you must go. Mother drew her down the steep ladder. Teacher Duad's house was full of eager, excited people greeting the Tuan. He was sitting upon the floor talking to them, asking them about their children and their crops, and smiling at this one and that one. Kondima saw her own father shake hands with the Tuan. Are your children here? asked Tuan. Yes, they are all here, father smiled with pride. He handed baby Bonnie to the Tuan so that he might lift the fine baby boy and see how heavy he was growing. Chaya stood be behind her father, shyly waiting. Presently, he took her hand and drew her forward. This is the big girl, said the Tuan, putting one arm around the child. And where is the little lively one, Kandima? At this, a number of people began calling, Kandima, Kandima, in a loud voice. Mother thrust the embarrassed child forward, and then the two on saw. A look of sharp pain crossed his sensitive face. He handed baby Bonnie back to father and released Chaya. As he cupped the little Kandima's chin in his hand, and turned the sad little face up to his. There was nothing to be seen in the kind gray eyes, but a warm smile of great friendliness. Then he drew the afflicted little one to his arms. He held her so all through the evening while he talked with the villagers, and while they sang and prayed. The baskets of cakes were passed around with coconut and brown sugar. When the happy company broke up, everyone was sleepy. Mother had already taken baby Bonnie home. Father took Kandima from Tuan's arms and started down the ladder. Wait a minute, the Tuan said, as he laid a straining hand on Father's arm. Wait just a minute. I want to talk with you. Father came back into the room and waited expectantly. Chaya and Kandima sat on the ladder outside. Your little Kandima has had a bad accident to her eye. Then father told him the whole sad story. It has been almost two moons already, father sighed. But what can we do? The eye is finished. No one can bring back the eye, even with the most powerful medicine. That is true. It was... Tuan's deep, soft voice speaking again. That is true, but we must save the other eye. If something is not done, she will lose the left eye too and be entirely blind. Then the missionary told father that he would take Kandima down to his home at the big seaport town and find the best medicine possible to cure the fever, fever and inflammation in the good eye. Father promised to think it over. Unhappy parents talked about the Tuan's proposition late into the night. I wonder if it would really do any good, Mother's voice held tears. She is so young, Father hesitated. She has never been beyond our valley. Of course, she would be homesick and cry all the time. She would make the Tuan's family very miserable with her crying. There was a silence for a moment. I'm afraid of the white man's medicine. Is it not commonly reported that the white people steal the jungle children and use their hearts and their livers to make medicine? I've heard that they shoot people with a gun like a thorn. People go to sleep for hours after being shot with such a gun, and they are even cut open. That's what they 
That's when they take their hearts and livers out for medicine. I don't believe those stories, Father turned restlessly. I don't think they steal people. Mother was silent for a long time, and then she spoke with firm decision. No, I will not let her go. I might never see my child again. What has happened, what is... What has happened has happened. We will let it be as it is. Then Father began to argue that it might be a good thing to try the white man's medicine. The Tuan is very kind, he began. He has little ones of his own. He would not let no harm he would let no harm come to her. Did you not see how kindly he held her tonight? But mother had made up her mind. Kadima, listening from her mat in the corner, turned her face to the wall and cried herself to sleep. Kadima, oh Kadima, Mukit's voice rose in a happy shout. Kadima opened the door just a little. Mukit and Aljaya were standing at the foot of the ladder. My knife, my knife, cried Mukit, waving a bright object around his head. You said Tuan wouldn't bring it, but he did, he did. Kadima slammed the door as hard as she could, seeing it was open just a little way, but nothing could shut out Mukit's and Aljaya's laughter. Kadima went to the far side of the hut and looked out the only window. Tuan and teacher Dawad were standing over by the teacher's house. Snatches of their conversation reached the little girl's keen, keen ears. We must have a school for them, Doad. The boys should learn to work with wood and iron. The girls must learn to sew and cook and care for children. All of them should learn to read and write. Teacher Doad nodded, and there was more talk which Kandima couldn't hear. Then they both turned and walked up the ladder into Doad's house. Teacher Doad had been in the village for six months already, and Kadima knew that it had been planned from the time he came that a school should be established. But there were many fears from many things to be overcome in the hearts of the villagers. They could not see the advantage of sending their girls to school to learn reading and writing, when they would never do anything but tend babies, cook rice, and care for gardens and pigs. There might be some reason for boys to go to school, but the villagers were doubtful even in regard to this. So the school, which the native teacher had often talked about, had not been started. I think I'll go over and play with teacher Jawad's puppy. Kandima opened the door and started down the ladder. Angry as she, she was, it was still disappointing to see no one about. Actually, she wanted very much to see Mukit's knife. The puppy was only an excuse. The little girl walked straight to the teacher's house. The puppy was playing on the grass in the shade of a coconut tree. She threw herself down beside him laid her face against his long, silky ear, and cried. Dear puppy, I wish I could be a puppy, too. Nobody likes to see me anymore. Mukit and Alija are so mean, I can't go to the Tuan's house. The puppy turned and licked her face with grave sympath sympathy. Kadima, she turned at the sound of a pleasant voice and looked up to see Tuan standing in the door of Teacher Duad's house. Did you help make the cakes we had last night? Kadima's heart warmed with pleasure. Tuan came down the ladder and sat down on the grass beside the puppy. He drew Kadima close and they sat quietly for some time. She looked up at the sight of Teacher Dawad's house. There were six baskets nailed to the wall. Dawad's hens slept in those fine bedchambers every night. Dawad called each hen by name. They were good, well-trained hens. 
every night after they had supper of unhucks, husked rice, and table scraps, Dawad would call each one to him. He would lift her and set her feet in a pan of clean water and wash all the dust from her feet. With a clean cloth, he would wash and polish the beak of each chickabid and then thrust her into the little door of her bedroom basket. All those hens lack is a good night kiss, laughed Tuan the first time he saw Dawad put them to bed. The puppy, too, was clean and fat. Dawad bought canned milk for the puppy whenever he went down to the big city 40 miles away. He never bought any milk for himself, but he always carried a few cans in his, in his bone hunts, so the puppy might have a special treat. The puppy had a bath in warm, soapy water every day, too. Teacher Dwad explains that since he had no wife and no children, the only way he could set a good example was to take care of his pets. Kadima looked at the baskets. Then she looked at the puppy. The Tuan and Dawad are both just good. That's what they are. Tuan pulled the puppy into his lap. I want to tell you a story, Kadima. The little girl waited expectantly. Once there was a little girl, as big as you are right now, she was a pretty little girl, and she went about singing merry songs all day long, making everyone happy with her cheerful ways. Then one day a sad thing happened. The little girl was walking along the road with her sister when a naughty girl picked up a stone and threw it. It just happened that this pretty little girl turned her head at the very moment the stone was thrown, and it hit her right in the face. Oh, how the stone hurt the poor little girl. It broke her nice, straight little nose and made her sick for a long time. She was never, never, she never was very strong after that. The little girl could never be proud anymore, for her face was no longer pretty. She was sick and miserable, miserable most of the time. Kandima searched Tuan's face with such eagerness that the gray eyes grew misty for just an instant. Tuan, did anyone ever like the little girl anymore? Oh, yes. That is the wonderful part of the story. You see, the little girl was very lonely at first, and so she learned to talk with Jesus. When she couldn't sleep at night, she would talk to him and be comforted. She became so sweet and gentle in all her ways that she was loved more than most people are, in spite of her disfigured face. She lived a long and happy life. What was the little girl's name, Tuan? questioned Kandima. Her name was Ellen. Tuan smiled down at her. The warm feeling began to come back to Kandima's heart. Her throat cleared, and she took a deep breath. The little brown hand found its way into the big, strong one, and they sat for a long time, looking out across the purple valley. Dawad found them thus when he came back from the spring, with the rice all washed and ready to put over the fire. Kadima jumped up with a little of her old-time energy. She had forgotten about Mulkit, but there was Mulkit sitting on the ladder to her own house. He thrust a rudely carved doll into her hands. See, see Kadima? I made this baby for you the first thing. Aren't you glad the Tuan gave me the knife? The toy was a simple one, but in Kandima's eyes, it was wonderful. She hugged the crude baby to her breast in ecstasy. Oh, Mood Kits, how did you do it? Thus forgiven and reinstated, Mood Kit became eloquent. It is a magic knife. He took it from his pocket. I will make you a little rice huller and a bam buffalo cart like they have down in the city. Then he drew out a small stick, 
of soft wood. After handing the knife to Kandima so she could feel its sharpness, he showed her how easily the wood was cut. See, it has three blades. He opened them all out fanwise. No one in this village has so good a knife. I will keep it as long as I live. When Kandima woke the following morning, the Tuan was gone. Teacher Duad was singing in his house. The village had returned to its usual quiet round of daily duties. Tell Kukit's daughter to come over here. Duat called to Kadima. It was only a step from Kadima's house to the hut of Kokit's daughter, who strapped her small baby to her back and followed Kadima. On the floor in the teacher's house was a pile of clothing. There were several small garments. Duat began pulling these out. Are you going to give these to me for my baby? The eyes of Kokit's daughter widened with surprise. Yes, Tuan told me that you must have some warm things for the baby so he won't get sick like your other ones did. The Tuan is very good, said Kokit's daughter, as she rolled the garments into a neat bundle. You may have this little blanket too, Tuan handed over a pink checked blanket bound with wide binding. Your baby will find, well, your baby will be like the son of Raja now, laughed the young teacher. Here's a little pot of rubbing medicine for your father. Tell him to warm it over the fire before putting it on his body. During the day, Kandima heard other people called to Dawad's house. All of them went away with some token of the Tuan's kind thoughtfulness. But for Kadima herself, Tuan had left nothing. Oh yes, he had left something. Kadima tried to think what it was that Tuan had left. It was the story, the story about the little girl who was hit in the face by the stone. After all, Kadima's family were not poor. They did not need clothing. It was the poor of the village that had been remembered. That night after Kandima went to bed, she thought for a long time about the little girl whose face had been spoiled by a cruel stone. As she laid quietly under her mosquito curtain, she asked of the soft darkness, Jesus, are you here? Will you be... A friend to me like you were to the little girl Tuan told me about. For the first time since the accident, Kandima fell asleep without crying.